Hi, Steve Livingston here. So this is a session that I did, or very similar to a session I did for a bunch of tech entrepreneurs here in the UK. Uh, they were on a kind of accelerator program and I taught them through tax incentives at each stage of the journey from the life cycle of a typical UK startup. And a few of them kind of their sort of faces dropped in terms of like, why did nobody tell us about this before? Uh, we didn't know about these. And as I ran through various bits here, I'm going to run through with you now. They're kind of saying, you know, I can kind of see now why certain companies have obviously got ahead of us. And I've always wondered how they did this. And now it's starting to make sense. And all these sort of things uh, they weren't aware of and they hadn't been taught. Some of them were already up and running and just kind of like, whoa, 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 whoa where does this come from? We didn't know about this. Now, all of these are UK government tax incentives. There's nothing racy here. These are just kind of incentives that are out there. But kind of navigating all this is kind of quite complex. And uh, that's why kind of it helps really just here to have a kind of idea of some of the things that are out there for you on your journey so I'm going to canter through this it will be fast um, I don't want to sort of ramble for hours uh, because there'll be certain elements that be useful for you and others that might not be so much so I'm going to go through it really quickly if there's anything at all in here that you think oh I'd like to know more about it obviously you can reach out to me uh, contact details in the description but also you know just leave comment maybe and I can do a separate video on a separate sec separate section um, if anything you're thinking oh I'll know more about that so let's kick off. Um, as I say here, I mean, that kind of uh, blow my trumpet. A lot of stuff you kind of high street. A lot of uh, smaller accountants won't be aware of. I won't know how to. They might have an awareness, but don't kind of get in the trenches with this every day like people myself do. Um, so uh, sort of little subtle in there. I think you have a good accountant who understands this sort of stuff. So first of all, setting up the company. Now the, you know SES and EIS are some of the most generous tax incentives out there so you're looking to raise funding for your new startup you need to get funded in the most appropriate way the most tax efficient way and these are government tax incentives SES is for smaller companies startups EIS is for growing companies generally up to seven years old although it can go longer if you're a knowledge intensive company won't go into that now but beyond the scope of this so why would you have SES and EIS well if you think about it how are you going to get general people high net worth business angels to invest in your company even you have a great project plan great idea could go huge we all know the kind of what the success rates of companies are generally you know it's nine out of ten companies fail um and plus one of the biggest problems is if you you know if you consider yourself as a high net worth individual you've got the choice i can either invest in this startup uk limited company where my money is tied up and i can't get it back out again or i could put it in a the stock market where okay my gains might not be quite as big potentially but if i want that money back i can just you know press a button and i get the cash back within trading hours and the money's back in my bank account they need a way to prize this cash away from high net worths and anyone really who's kind of willing to invest in a, a startup. Um, and what this does is it gives tax relief to the investors, not the company, not use the company, but to investors to entice them to part with their cash. So how does it work for SES? The biggest one, the two biggest ones really. SES is income tax relief on the investment of 50%. EIS is 30%. <clears throat> but so for SES, 50% um, of the amount they invest uh, so companies can raise £250,000 under SES and uh, every individual has got £200,000 annual allowance they can put into SES funds, uh, funded companies. So that's kind of the big sort of uh, take there. So if they've got a, that sort of tax liability in the current tax year or the previous tax year, they can offset it against the tax they've suffered. Um, that's like slightly low for EIS at 30%. And the other big kind of giveaway is a CGT free sale for them after three years. So it's a whole period of three years and say you get approached by a company to be taken over, those SES and EIS investors can exit tax free. Huge, better than you'll get. Also, IHT benefits after two years. I say benefits used to be uh, tax-free after two years. The budget came in 2024, made some changes. We'll get to that now. Not quite as good as it was, uh, but still good. Uh, income tax loss relief if it fails. So the capital the capital loss can be converted into an income tax loss um, so they get more relief. So the downside protection is quite large. You're looking at about 70-ish percent um, for, in most cases, for investors, uh, high, you know, high net worths. Um, there's also CGT reinvestment opportunity. We won't go into that now. It's a bit more complicated. Points to note, it's an issue of shares. In this case, you're going to be diluted. You've got to issue new shares in the company to be able to get this relief. Um, and uh, it's not a loan. It's not something like that. It's, and it's not you selling part of your shares. 
or try to divvy out that way, it's an issue of a fresh issue of shares. You've got to stay compliant for three years after each share issue. So it kind of extends that runway and there's certain things you can and can't do that you need to be aware of. And that's where having an accountant who understands this stuff, uh, not dropping any more hints there, but you get the drift. Uh, limits on the size, sort of the amounts you can raise. I kind of alluded that to earlier. S has got its own limit. Yeah, S has got a bigger limit. Um, thresholds and it can be size, age, excluded activities, lots of things around that. Strict rules around order of reliefs. Got to be SAS first, then EIS only. Um, and it's, you get the gist of this. It's quite complex. So you need someone who understands this sort of stuff. Uh, always helps. So that's S and EIS. You've got to be aware of that. And this is one area where these a lot of these founders were sat there going, what? I never even heard of it. And I was like, I can't believe you haven't heard of it. You've got to have heard of this. It's so important. Um, you know, it's some companies, some founders are all over this and some are evidently not aware of it. So uh, that's the first one. Uh, next thing, yeah, incentivize your key team members. Um, so what I'm thinking about here is um, EMI share options is the most obvious way of doing this. So uh, EMI is a kind of, I say, tax approved, HMRC approved. It's not, yeah, it's not approved. It's a recognized um, share option scheme whereby you're basically saying to your current employees, you uh, you know you're already important to us. These people it can be some or all. You can dice it up how you like. Um, be basically saying um, rather than giving you shares now, we're going to give you a piece of paper which is an option paper, which basically you have the option to acquire shares at some point in the future. And the benefits of this are you're not then having to be immediately um, giving shares to employees. There are tax issues around that anyway. But if you think about it, you know, you give like early days, whatever percentage to one person, whatever percentage to another person, they decide to leave. You've got problems around trying to buy back the shares, whatever, and there's sorts of issues. Maybe them sat at the table asking for information about the company, being involved. Um, it's, it gets messy. So the cleanest way to do it is with the share option scheme. So it's kind of saying, rather than you worrying yourself with having sh actual shares now, I'll give this piece of paper and say you can trigger it at some stage in the future. Um, I say that, so I'm jumping through these points here, but kind of in terms of how you can do that, is you can have performance conditions on it if you wanted to. You could structure it as exit only, so they only ever get the actual shares at the point of sale. So it kind of, again, stops you having kind of lots of minority shareholders at any one point. Um, very, very common. I think about, I don't know, it's most ones I tend to see are exit only. Um, keeps it nice and tidy in that way. And it's a great way of, A, retaining cash in the company because you can maybe use this as an incentive as, you know, rather than bonuses or really high market wage, we're going to give you shares under the share option scheme. It's a way of kind of, sort of balancing out the cash demands on the company. It's a great way of tying people in or incentivizing them or both, really. So, you know, stay with us for the journey. You'll get your shares at the end and kind of incentivize in the sense of they're, they're really motivated because they are kind of sort of shareholders. So they kind of really want the company to work um, and they're going to be incentivized in that way. Um, I say do it early on because the earlier you do it, the lower, the lower the valuation you can agree with HMRC so they can get that growth and value of the shares, these employees. Um, and uh, obviously the longer you leave it, you start getting revenue, you start beginning, your valuation goes up and up and up. That bar is getting higher and higher in terms of less, less growth potential for these individuals, these employees, team members. So that's a great one to do early doors. Um, that, that's useful. Um, run YouTube. If you can subscribe, like this video, it helps other, other founders find the video. So if you can contribute in that way, that's great. Uh, R&D tax credits is another one um, to think about. So the R&D tax credit relief uh, really helps your cash go further. If you think about it, you know, you've got the SESES funds in, you're building a new platform, your new product, your new service, whatever it is. And if it's got kind of novelty to it and there's kind of uh, certain ways in which it's pushing the boundaries in your particular sector, you may have the potential for R&D tax relief. I say may because uh, it's always been strict, the rules, they've got even more kind of strict in terms of how HMRC are applying the rules. Um, so it's got a bit more challenging and the rules have been tinkered all sorts of different ways over the past few years. We're now in, from April 2024, we've got the RDEC and the SME intensive schemes, uh, the two main uh, reliefs uh, that are in existence. Not quite as generous as it used to be in the past with the old SME scheme, um, but uh, still well worth having. I've mentioned that increased HMRC compliance and scrutiny of claims these days. So really making sure you get somebody who's experienced in this to help you. And again, we do a lot of R&D claims for companies. So making sure that you um, 
jump through the right hoops, put together a really robust claim that is supportable in the event of HMRC challenging it. I did a video yesterday on this, uh, so please go back and check that out um, where I talk about the current landscape of the R&D relief. It's a non-dilutive form of finance, unlike the SS EIS, so it's great. Um, there are some more limits than there used to be around uh, overseas subcontracting, pays you in caps, but it's still well, well worth exploring because it's still super generous uh, overall. Okay, uh, patent box, kind of less used these days, um, but it's um, uh, really good relief. It's basically if you can get a qualifying patent, and I say it's more difficult because getting a patent these days or any time is difficult and creates commercial risks, issues, um, but if it is something that's part of your, I, think I wouldn't do it for this, but if it's part of your roadmap to get a patent, then it's brilliant because current high level, the current main rate of corporation tax in the UK is currently 25%. So you think about that sort of journey you're on. Let's go back up here again. So uh, you're here, kind of, this is your SES EIS up down at the very beginning. You can start building up your EMI scheme here. Uh, you're maybe doing your R&D kind of stuff here. You get some more cash in for the next push up. The R&D can carry on over a number of years. It's not a one-off thing. So if the project's still going, you maybe got another R&D claim here. Um, and then at this point, kind of maybe you start to reach kind of revenue. So you develop the platform, uh, you're pushing out the marketplace. And there was this sort of question mark around, well, it's been brilliant so far. We've had SES, we've had EIS, we've had um, off the EMI share options, we've had R&D tax credits. We're now at commercialization phase. There's not kind of as much in terms of next stage in, um, of relief. And the patent box was introduced for kind of companies that are now profitable and are starting to pay corporation tax. So it kind of helps mitigate that corporate corporation tax slightly. Um, so slightly, it's, it's better than it was because it's now um, 10%. Sorry, it's now 25% versus 10%. The corporation tax previously was 19%, so the benefit's bigger. So 10% um, rate on product service on worldwide profits, bearing that in mind. It's got to be UK, EU, certain EU accredited patent offices that um, uh, grant the patent. A US patent alone won't suffice. Um, patent must be granted for you to make a claim. So patents, patent pending, you can't make the claim at that stage. It's only when it's granted. You've got to be involved in the development of the uh, actual underlying patent invention. And you've got to have taxable profits to benefit because it's a kind of, it's a reduction of corporation tax payable. Um, and it works alongside the R&D relief. There's nothing to note there. Finally, comes to end here. I think that was something that was moved. Oh, they were meant to be down here. But there you go. So look at that little bit of decoration there. I like going there. There you go. Bosh. Don't know why they're there. But anyway, um, exit planning. Uh, yes. So you get at the end of your cycle now. That graph is getting towards the end. You've done really well. You've jumped through all these hoops. You're now coming to sell your business and you're looking at business asset disposal relief, BADR. It was more catchily known as Entrepreneur's Relief, was a better name, I think. But that's what it was known formally as. Used to be 10%. Well, it's been 10% for a long time, um, as opposed to the main rate corporation tax, which has fluctuated all over the place. Uh, but it was 10% on, uh, so I can't remember, it was like 1 million and 5 million, then pretty much 10, 10 million, then whatever. It's now down to, it's right now in November 2024, it's 10% on the first million. From April 25, it goes up to 14% on the first million. And from April 26, in the current rules, it goes up to 18% on the first million. Um, not as good as the... Um, current rate of 10 percent yeah as it as i mentioned so that's going up from that uh, but it's better than the new standard upper rate of 24 percent bash um so that's kind of where we are with that um not as good as it was you know and also your ses eis people get away tax-free so for the for the founder it's a bit i think it's a bit harsh i'd like to see some changes around that maybe we'll see some softening of that in the years to come but this autumn budget statement 2024 that's just happened fairly recently was putting sledgehammer in there so um anyway that's where we are right now still better than better than the normal rules and kind of ending with yeah get yourself a good account who understands this sort of stuff there are my contact details uh please get in touch if you want any help and also look back through my other videos i've got a load of stuff here on ses and eis i'll be doing more and more stuff as well so please subscribe um if you haven't already uh, like this video if you possibly can because it helps more people find it um but that's a canter through the life cycle of a UK startup in terms of current UK tax incentives. There are others in amongst all this we could look at um, in, other, in future videos, so please subscribe for that. But I hope you found that useful. Thanks for watching.